Hi everyone and welcome to the channel. In today's video we're going to be taking a look at part 2 of the IBM Personal Computer 300GL. Now if you haven't seen part 1 there'll be a link to it down in the description. Go and check that out so you can see what we've been up to. But just sort of quickly in summary we had a look around this thing, we got into the history of it a little bit, we took the lid off, we had a look inside to see what makes it tick, got it booted up, everything seemed to be working, but we were met with a Novell Netware logon client that I don't know the password to. In the meantime I've been doing a few bits and bobs to it, mainly stripping it down and cleaning it as you can see from these uh, clips here. Not too bad on the inside, mainly just a bit of dust rather than anything too serious. And the light scratches on the case work on the outside. They uh, came off nice and easy with a bit of a magic eraser. And as for that third LED that we saw on the front of the case in part one that we thought might be a network activity light, turns out there's nothing fitted behind it. So whatever it's for, it's not fitted to this model. But other than that, everything's come up nice and clean and that brings us to where we are at present. So coming up against that Novell Netware logon client, that gave me a bit of a dilemma, not really sure what to do. As I say, don't know the password, so I had a look. There do seem to be some utilities out there that could uh, crack that password, assuming they do what they say they, uh, say they do. But the websites, they looked really shady. I'd probably get about a million viruses if I actually tried to download anything off them, so decided that wasn't the way to go. Did connect the hard drive to a different computer so we could at least have a look at the contents. Uh, there wasn't any interest in software on there, nothing that needed taking off and uh, archiving, you know, sticking on archive.org or anything like that. It just looks like this was a simple sort of file server that sat in a business somewhere, uh, which is, you know, exactly what you'd expect for this sort of machine, especially once we saw it was running Windows NT. So in terms of going forward, um, it seemed the obvious thing to do then would be to uh, wipe the hard disk and then reinstall the OS. But I was sort of umming and ahhing about what OS to install. On the one hand, we could put Windows NT back on, like what it currently has. But on the other hand, we could go for one of the home versions of Windows, so perhaps Windows 95 or maybe Windows 98. My thinking behind that is that there'd be more software for 95 and 98 that'd let us showcase uh, you know, what this machine can do. And it might be a little bit more limited uh, if we were to use uh, Windows NT. However, at that point, I then had another idea. Let me uh, turn the camera around and I'll explain. This is my retro desk. It's where my uh, retro computers that stay out all the time live. So there's this system on the top, there's a couple more underneath, and if I want to use a piece of software, play a game, try out a bit of hardware long term, it's one of the systems on this desk is what I'd come and do that on. Now this top system, it sort of serves two purposes. It's an MS-DOS and Windows 3.1 machine, it's all on compact flash card. If I just take that card out, bob another one in, it then becomes my Windows 95 machine. But there are a number of problems with this that I'd like to try and address. The first problem is all the systems on this desk are connected to a KVM. So keyboard, video and mouse switch. The mouse and keyboard, which are on a tray under the desk, and the screen, in theory, should be shared between all the systems. However, this is an AT system, uh, AT connected for the keyboard, and I've tried different converters, I've tried different KVMs, I just cannot get the keyboard on this to play nice with any of the KVMs. So every time I want to use it, I've got to drag an AT keyboard out, stick it on the desk where I'm already short to room. It's just a bit of a pain in the backside, really. Likewise, it's also a serial mouse, not PS2. So you can see there's, um, it has its own mouse that lives with it because I can't get the serial to talk to the KVM either. So that too is a bit of a pain. Second problem is just the general state of this case. You know, it's scratched to heck on the top. It's got a bit of rust on this side. The front's really yellowed. I mean, it was retrobrighted when I got it, but it's just faded again over the last few years. These drive bay covers, they're not original. It never had any in when I got it. They're just the closest thing I've got. And if you touch them, they fall inside the computer and you've got a great big hole in the front, which, which is not what you want. 
And that's not to say I don't like this case. I, I do. I really like desktop form, you know, desktop form factor cases. I mean, almost everything's a tower these days. But it's just that this one, it's not a particularly good surviving example, you know, of this kind of case. And the third problem is also related to it being an AT machine in that I don't really have many AT machine parts. So if something in here fails, depending on what it is, it'd be difficult or expensive for me to try and replace it. So sort of thinking about those three issues, that's when I came up with the idea. What if I took all the parts that are in here and put them in here? And then this would then go on the desk in place of the system that we just saw. Now we can't bring uh, every part across, I mean the motherboard in here is proprietary to it for example, you know it's got that custom riser that we saw in part one. So we'd have to stick with the motherboard and therefore have to stick with that CPU or another similar CPU. But the other things, you know, graphics card, sound card, so on, all that could come and uh, go into this machine. And I think in doing so, that'd solve, uh, you know, the three problems that we just talked about. I mean, for starters, yes, there is this cover missing, but I am looking out for one. But nonetheless, it's still in way better condition than the uh, machine that we just looked at. It's PS2 for keyboard and mouse, so there's no reason to think that we should have any problems getting it to talk to the uh, KVM. And third, it's an ATX based machine, so while there are some proprietary parts, as we've just said, if something in here fails, there's a much greater chance that I'd have a part that could be, uh, you know, put in to replace it, fix it, keep the machine going. So I think the first thing we need to do then is get this machine disconnected. We'll get it over to the bench, we'll take it to bits, and then we can see what parts exactly we're going to combine with the 300GL to build that machine back up. So let's get stuck in. And there we go. I've stripped out all the parts that are coming out of the uh, old computer. Obviously the AT motherboard and CPU are staying in here since they're not compatible with the 300GL. Likewise with the AT power supply. I've left the RAM on this motherboard for now. It's got 64 meg with two 32 meg sticks. The 300GL had that single 64 meg stick and there's nothing really to choose between them timing wise so I think we'll stick with a single 64 in, in, uh, in that for now. So that's the old one done with. Let's have a look at what parts we're going to be putting back into the 300GL. First up we're going to have to put the Pentium 2 CPU back in. Uh, this is um, as I've said a 350 megahertz chip uh, which is definitely a fair bit faster than I'd like for this system. The CPU that was in the old computer was a Pentium 133 and whilst I think that's a fairly sweet spot for Windows 95 it's more than fast enough for anything for DOS or Windows 3.1. At 350 MHz and been a sort of generation ahead as well I'd like to keep the CPU speed relatively uh, close to what I had before. Now from what I understand the early uh, date codes of these chips were multiplier unlocked so hopefully it'll just be a case of um, underclocking this in the BIOS and that should get us down to 233 MHz if not actual 233 MHz CPUs seem fairly uh, plentiful on eBay so that shouldn't be an issue it's still a lot faster than I'd like but it'll definitely be closer and it's pretty much as good as we're going to get with this without resorting to something more drastic like um, undoing, you know, you know, disabling the L2 cache which would uh, bring things far slower than what we want. I wouldn't use this system for any of the early DOS uh, sort of speed sensitive games so it's not, um, you know, it's not something that's going to cause any problems there. It's nice to see that we've got the big uh, passive heatsink on. It does sit quite close to a 80mm fan in front of the case. 
uh, just you know, just to get a bit of airflow over it. But that's much um, slower spinning and much quieter than the you know than the ones that have got the little fan built in. Next up, graphics card. We're not going to be using the onboard video. We're going to be using this instead. This is a Matrox Millennium. Uh, one of the original long PCB versions. This one's outfitted with 4 megs of video RAM. No sort of 3D features, you know, 3D acceleration to speak of on here. Um, if I was going to use, you know, 3D accelerated games personally, I'd rather put those on Windows 98 or later with a bit more sort of powerful hardware. Uh, what these were really known for was their excellent 2D quality. Uh, between Matrox's own chip and the quality of the components that they selected, like the RAM DAC and such like on these boards, the 2D analog video out of them was uh, was excellent. And particularly, you know, back in the days of uh, CRTs and people using these to push higher resolutions, you needed as clean a video signal as you can get. And these were pretty much as good as you could get at the time. PCI card, so we should be able to boot straight to this uh, from the BIOS. Its drivers were well mature for both Windows 3.1 and uh, 95, so it's a good card to use for a system like this. Moving on to the sound card, nothing wrong with that Creative uh, Vibra 16 based card that was in there, but instead we're going to be bringing this across and putting this in. It's a Creative Sound Blaster uh, CT4500 aka the or 64 this is the value edition not the gold one one of the main things that the value edition uh, lacked was the uh, the sim slot that you had on the gold one for increasing the onboard memory so you could load lots of sound fonts for your midi and whatnot not something i really do much of with this system so not something i miss on this in terms of just you know gaming and you know midi performance wavetable etc sound quality of these things is fine for me Usual complement of ports on the back with your speakers out, line in, line out, game port, headphones, etc. Uh, we've got CD uh, audio piped straight in at the top. As I say, good sound quality out of these. Again, drivers uh, well mature for both DOS and Windows. So uh, this is the card we are going to be using. Here's the network card that came out of the uh, 300GL. Uh, based on uh, IBM's own chip. Um, main thing is we've got a 10-100 uh, speed RJ45 on there. Uh, presume there's nothing wrong with this card. It is as of yet untested and I'm sure we could get drivers for this. But just for simplicity's sake, we're going to be going with uh, this 3Com card instead. It's a 3Com 3C905B. These are easy to find. Lots of people you know, uh, use these in retro systems. They're a really popular card. It's you know easy to find relatively cheap drivers easy to get and just just work basically so this is what we're going to be going with same on the back 10 100 card rj45 connector nice and simple moving on to storage as i've said use the ide to compact flash adapters this is just a cheap one off ebay nothing special about it they've always worked okay for me That'll uh, let me swap the compact flash cards between the DOS slash Windows 3.1 installation and the Windows 95 one. Now I am going to bring this CD-ROM drive across as well. Uh, this is the one out of the old computer. Uh, it's nice and clean. It's a 16-speed drive uh, made by Hitachi, I think. Uh, ooh, that's reflected terribly. Yep, an Hitachi drive. Uh, the one in the 300GL is only a 6-speed, and again, nothing really wrong with that, but um, I think 16 speeds, uh, for Windows 95, it's a nice kind of sweet spot. It's not one of the later drives of those sort of screamingly loud 52-speed jobs, but it's not too slow either. We're not going to be waiting um, you know, forever for everything to load, so this is the one we're going to go with. And finally, floppy disk drive. Here's the one from the 300GL. Uh, it's still in its little mounting frame, as you can see. Now, this is uh, untested, and deliberately so. Uh, you may recall that when we booted the 300GL up and the uh, floppy drive seat, it made some really sort of sad seek noises when it did. So, I think if I put a disk in here, it's just going to chew it up. So, instead of risking it with that... Whoops. We'll bring the uh, floppy disk drive across from the 
um, from the old machine. It's a Panasonic drive. This was new old stock when it went in, so it's had very little use. And I think if we just pop the uh, bezel off the front there um, and put it in the frame, everything should line up in terms of uh, disc eject button and whatnot. So again, to be on the safe side, this is the one we're gonna go with. Right, let's get these parts in the 300 GL. Right, so finally got this thing together, but it's been a bit more of a pain in the backside than I thought it would be. Originally, what I wanted to do was put this sound card in the bottom ISA slot, the network card, which is just hiding in there, um, in the shared slot, graphics card in the middle PCI slot, and then even though it doesn't use the actual slot itself, the compact flash reader would use the top uh, sort of case opening, uh, if you like, you know, for access uh, to the compact flash card. The problem is these uh, CPU posts for the C, you know, that support the CPU, they're triangulated at the bottom, I guess, to give them a bit of uh, extra strength. And because this sound card is very slightly taller than the one it replaced, it won't fit in the bottom ISA slot. It, um, it hits the CPU support post. It only just fits in this uh, shared slot. In fact, I had to slide the motherboard out in order to get it in. What that then means is the network card has to go in the middle PCI slot and graphics card in the top one. So the compact flash reader is now right down in the bottom. So I've had to kind of wedge the uh, IDE cables all the way under there uh, on top of the motherboard, which is not really ideal. Then the power supply for the compact flash reader uses a floppy style Molex connector. And there's only one on this power supply. So I had to find an adapter to go from that to a sort of big four pin Molex and then that one doesn't reach. Then we need another adapter to get through there and so on. And coupled with the fact that this opening here that is the only one for the cables to pass through is really tight now. So we've got a lot more cables coming through. It's just been a bit finicky to put together. Not to worry though, it's together now. I've uh, altered the dip switches which are kind of hidden down there behind the CPU. So. If this is a uh, unlocked uh, CPU, we'll shortly find out. That should give us a 233 MHz uh, CPU on a uh, 66 MHz bus. So we'll put the lid on, we'll get a screen, we'll get a keyboard and a mouse, and we'll power up and we'll see what we've got. Okay, booting up. And as you can see there, we're plugged into the uh, Matrox card. So it's recognized that over the onboard video, that's good. It's probably already set like that in the BIOS. The uh, floppy disk seek sound sounds a lot different to, to the old drive, so I'm glad I swapped that over. Um, configuration change has occurred. It's to be expected really from all the things we've messed about with. Ah, system summary. We're still at a Pentium 2 350, so it doesn't look like we have one of the unlocked CPUs. Bit of a shame, really, but it, it's not going to alter things, uh, you know, too, too much for what I want to do with this computer. So not a problem, really. Uh, yep, there you go. Matrix graphics. Uh, it's picking that up for the video controller. We're getting this full 64 meg of RAM still, and for the IDE hard disk zero that's my uh, ms dos and windows 3.1 uh compact flash card i see no reason why it shouldn't just boot straight into dos um, from here when we come out of the um, you know out, out the bios there's, there's, i don't think there's anything we, we need to change to get that to go and it's picked up the swapped cd rom drive as well so that's all good we'll save settings and hopefully get a dos prompt
Okay, here we are at the DOS prompt. That all seemed to go fine. Uh, we saw the sound card utility setting up there and the CD-ROM drives and whatnot, so all good. I don't think we've got any more tinkering to do here. We'll get it over onto the other desk and we'll get it set up properly. Welcome to the part of the video where I'm supposed to say, here's the 300GL, it's set up on the desk, everything's great, you know, doesn't it look fantastic? Remember those three problems um, from earlier in the video that we were trying to solve. Well, we've done all that and everything's hunky-dory. Well, one of those problems was that the old machine was a bit battered and not very nice looking. And uh, yeah, this, you know, solved that problem. This is much better aesthetically. It's in much nicer condition. And I think it looks great sat on the desk. I, you know, it's sort of really in keeping, I think, particularly with this uh, screen, this sort of blue arc uh, that's on the top of this uh, i'm not quite sure if you can see it in the video there but there's a bit of blue um, sort of decorative strip on top of the monitor it matches this down here almost perfectly so yeah looks lots better than the old machine but as you can probably guess it's not quite you know working as it should this is not plain sailing first up it's not playing nice with the kvm uh, that was one of the uh, problems that i wanted to solve with this but no, nope. when it's plugged into the KVM, the video switches like it's supposed to, but it will not recognize the keyboard and mouse. The keyboard and mouse work fine plugged into this. K KVM's still working with other systems. The keyboard and mouse work through the KVM on other systems, but no, nope, they won't work with this. I don't know why. Um, it's a BX uh, chipset in there. I've got another system under here that's also a BX chipset. They work on that, so obviously something wrong there that needs a bit more investigation. Secondly, as you can see here in MS-DOS, for some reason it's just crashing and hanging when uh, MS-CD-EX, uh, uh, sorry no, when the uh, CD-ROM driver tries to load. Quite why it's doing that, I've got no idea. Literally the only thing I've done is move it from the bench, which is behind the camera, to this desk. It was working on the bench, it's not working here. But hey, I guess that's the joys of uh, owning these old machines. It's never quite as straightforward as you hope it's going to be. But look, with these new problems that have cropped up, I think this video has gone on long enough. It looks like we're going to have to come back with a part three now where I'm going to go away. I'm going to do a bit more problem solving. We'll do a bit more digging. And then in the future, I'll update with where we get to on this. And hopefully we'll have a nice DOS Windows 3.1, Windows 95, 300GL, sat here and everything working as it should. But that's, as I say, that's going to be for another day. For now, I'm just going to say thank you very much for watching. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, give us a thumbs up and like and all that good stuff down in the comments. I'm still looking for a uh, panel, uh, you know, the uh, little decorative bit that goes around this uh, drive. If anybody knows where I could get my hands on one of them, again, please drop us a comment down below and let me know. But for now, I'm just going to say thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.